Welcome to everyone who's joining. I want to um, invite you to introduce yourself in the chat. We'll wait a minute or so while people join. Introduce yourself in the chat and let us know where you're calling in from or joining the call from. So again, welcome. This is our final in the series of Sustainable Herbs Program Toolkit webinar series. And I'm delighted to be co-hosting this webinar with Fair Wild, who's joining us. Brian, you will be speaking in a moment, joining us from the UK. I'm gonna share my screen with a few comments. So as I said, this is the last in the series of the toolkit webinar series. And this, this one will focus on equity and wild harvested plants and really looking at what it takes to, what fairness means in trade relationships. And we have a very packed schedule because our idea in this webinar is really to share the perspectives of different stakeholders, people who are really thinking about trade relationships and how to make them as equitable as possible and still meet the objective of sourcing wild collected plants for a global market. So we'll have four speakers talking about Fair Wild and implementing that. And then we'll have two speakers who are, who are scholars and active researchers who will really offer perspectives on those challenges and ask different questions. And then we'll go back to the speakers to talk about those issues. And there is one more webinar, which is not a toolkit webinar, but this is a webinar that's to launch, to kick off the Fair Wild Week, June 21st to the 25th. And this is jointly hosted by all the organizations you see, Traffic, Fair Wild, Sustainable Herbs Program, and FAO. And the registration for that webinar is on the American Botanical Council webinar website page. And we'll be sharing more information about that as well. And all of these webinars are made available for free through the generous support of the Sustainable Herbs Program underwriters. You can see those donors here and you can find out more information on all of them at the Sustainable Herbs Program website. And they are available for free because of the generous support of ABC members. You can find out more information about how to become a member of ABC at the ABC website, which is herbalgram.org. So with that, I want to turn to the panel and discussion today so that we have time for everyone to speak. And again, the idea here is really about fair trade agreements and how to make them as equitable as possible for the different stakeholders involved. And also these aren't static certifications. The idea is really to learn and improve. And so my, our hope, my hope in this conversation is really to take these ideas, both to see what the participants here have learned from engaging and implementing this particular certification and what, what questions and ideas can they take to move forward. And to introduce the speakers, I'm just gonna give brief introductions to give more time. Um, Bryony Morgan will be speaking first and she's the executive officer of the Fair Wild Foundation. Peter Rungus is here joining us from Slovenia. He's a business development manager at Arx Farm, and he'll say more about what that is. Marin Anastasov is a sourcing manager at Paka Herbs. Sorry if I mispronounced your name. And Giant Sanak is here from the Western Ghats of India, where he heads the Applied Environmental Research Foundation. And after the speakers speak, then we're joined by two guest discussants. Kristina Suderska, who's a principal researcher in IIED's Natural Resources Group, and Elizabeth Bennett, who's Associate Professor of International Affairs at Lewis and Clark College. So welcome, all of you. And with that, Bryony, I'd like to invite you to set the context a bit. You're muted. 
Yes, that's always the first challenge, isn't it? And so thanks so much, Anne, for the introduction and thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, it's really exciting to be able to have this uh, webinar and discuss these topics. So I think I'll just start by introducing a little bit about Fair Wild. We're an initiative that works globally with the aim to transform resource management and business practices to be ecologically, socially, and economically sustainable throughout the supply chain of wild collected products. So we really focus on trade and wild ingredients. Our main tool that we work with is the Fair Wild Standard and certification, certification System for Wild Ingredients. And I know many people are already quite familiar with Fair Wild, so I won't go into too much detail on that today. But just to explain, the, the purpose of the Fair Wild Standard is to ensure the continued use and also the long-term survival of wild species and populations in their habitats. So we're focused on environmental and, and biodiversity cons considerations but also respecting the traditions and cultures and the livelihoods of all the stakeholders, in particular collectors and those who are involved in processing and you know, the, the primary workers involved with, with the trade. So we have several important principles and mechanisms in Fair Wild that support these developments of mutually beneficial and long-term trade relationships that are focused on these goals around biodiversity conservation and respective cultural heritage and, and traditions and livelihoods. So on the side of the wild collection operation, uh, the Fair Wild Standard really looks at the contractual relationship between the wild collection operation and the collectors. So often in wild harvest, the people who are doing the harvesting are not employees, they're people who are maybe selling ingredients by the kilo. So they can have quite precarious contractual conditions. So we, we look at the relationship between them and how can we give them more, more security and um, representation also as well. You know, how can and their voice be, be heard in, in this trade? So Fair Wild, when you're implementing it, that can involve looking at how the collectors are organized and helping them to set up these representative structures and improve communication and, and agreements around pricing and, and all sorts of things. Fair Wild also looks at fair pricing and the payment that the collectors receive. So they should be getting long term and, and fair prices, which, which are also quite transparent. So they're involved in pricing decisions. They know how prices were set and they should be set at a fair income level that actually covers basic needs. So we have this living income concept embedded into Fair Wild and some experience with, with working towards that. Um, but Fair Wild also covers on the part of the wild collection company responsible business practices. So can they plan their harvest according to, to what the market needs to minimize waste, no, no waste of, of the ingredients that are being harvested? And can they really manage the resource harvesting well? So they have a resource assessment and a management plan, so they really know how much can be harvested and can they make contractual commitments also based on that information so they're not going to to sign up to to agreements to supply ingredients that are above what can actually be supported by the, the population of species there and we also have um we also look at the mechanisms around the financial viability of the sustainable wild harvesting operation so can these true costs of production so the management planning the monitoring the fair prices for the um, harvesters, can they be built into their pricing system and then use that information to negotiate a fair price, which may not be what the market is used to paying. And we often see that wild ingredients are undervalued. And if you really look at, at what it costs to, to you know, produce these ingredients fairly and sustainably, the price does of course has, have to go up and, and can that be negotiated in a transparent way and um, so on. And then on the side of the buyers, um, Fair Wild also has a principle around buyer commitment. So the standard says that the, the buyer of the wild collected products should also strive for these mutually beneficial long-term trade relations that, that are based on respect, transparency and support for the, for the supplier. Also in quality aspects, which is often a big part of the trade relationship. You know, the, the ingredients have to be supplied in, in a way that, 
meets the market requirements and, and also is, is good enough quality for the final products. So what we require there on the side of the buyers is support to suppliers. So that could include information, training, but, and favorable trading conditions, including forecasts, favorable terms of trade, ending trade relationships responsibly and with due notice if that happens, um, and agreeing upfront um, volumes, quality, price, and also any premium that would be paid. Of course, that can be really quite difficult to do, especially in the current situation when things are very fluid around um, impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. But again, this upfront provision of information on the part of the buyer as well. Um, and the other part is really the commitment of the buyer to pay these fair prices and the fair world premium and to be involved in, in supporting improvement of living and working conditions for people who are involved in harvesting. So I think that's all I'll say as an introduction, really. I think my time is up. So it's really just over to um, some of the participants in Farewell to explain a bit about how they've found working towards these principles in practice and, and both from Farewell, but also their broader experience in the industry as well, I think. So thanks very much. Great, thank Bryony. So Peter, would love to hear from your point of view. And if you can introduce sort of what your point of view is. To uh, sure, sure. First, first of all, uh, thanks for inviting me. Thanks for Sustainable Herbs Program and everyone else. And hi to basically the whole world. I see there are people from Tunisia and Romania here and everywhere. Uh, so I'm Peter. I'm coming from Slovenia from a company called Arxfarm. Actually, we it is a family company which operates in Slovenia and in Serbia, albeit on the other name. And I've been involved with the Fair Wild Scheme for about five years, I think so. Uh, since 2016, yeah, that makes it five years. Uh, I'm here to talk a bit more about the practical side of everything, about the collection and about maybe uh, some link from the collection to final to the final customer. Um, I've started with all this story because there was an interest from the buyer from the UK uh, to start a production to, to start a collection of rose hips in Serbia. Rose hips, I don't know how much you know, is a very old, let's say, product from the region of Yugoslavia. It has been collected for probably 100 years or more uh, in, on a big scale. Uh, before, it was collected traditionally. Uh, so after Yugoslavia ended in the 90s, this collection went down dramatically. So the projects like ours is trying to restart all of this. So when we started, it was... Uh, quite different for us because we weren't used to it. Uh, the company which I found which did this uh, is in the town Svrlik in uh, southern Serbia and they did organic collection before but of course nothing like Fair, uh, fair Wild. So we had to add this um, we had to add this Fair components to the whole organic to the whole organic system and of course this of course of course the, this uh, Fair or uh, equitable or however we call it, equitable is maybe more of a legal term, uh, is, uh, is quite different in Serbia, in perhaps India or US or all over the world, and also from person to person. So how to add this, you know, you, know, you have gui guidelines from Fairwild and so on, but when you start doing this, it takes a lot of uh, imagination, it takes a lot of creative, uh, creative thinking, to create a system, how will you determine the price, which will be valid for more than one year, supposedly, but at least for one year? Uh, how are you going to construct everything? So uh, we didn't, luckily, we didn't have problems with the uh, ch child labor, with uh, um, uh, racism, with uh, systemic racism or stuff like that. The only problem which we faced was at the beginning how to calculate this fair price, right? Because uh, in general, everybody who are not doing fair, fair, fair wild uh, are doing, let, let, let's say, conventional collection. Um, they are paying market price. So when there is a lot of rose hips, the prices goes down. When there is less of it, like if it's a bad year, the prices go up. We stabilized that. And how we did it? Well, probably there were more than one way. How we did it is we took a 
average uh, wage in Serbia, which at that time was around 400 euros. Uh, and we said, if collector was collecting for eight hours a day, five days a week for a month, and if there is some average, let's say, average, uh, average uh, amount that he can collect an hour, how much would he, would he be able to earn in a month? And we said he should be able to earn at least 400 euros. And that's how we started. And we fixed the price. Uh, it was uh, five years ago. And we never had a problem with uh, obtaining enough uh, material, enough quantity. What does that mean? Well, that tells us that collectors are willing to sell to us at that price. Firstly, because the price is higher than, than competition. And secondly, also they are attracted by the stability, by fair wild premium, which is a, a special concept under, uh, under which final customer uh, pays certain amount on the special uh, in the special fund which helps develop develop the collectors community for example we we gave money to a kindergarten we paid scholarships and so on so all all, all this helps that helps to make everything more fair more equitable uh, and um, at the beginning we didn't know how we, we will do that and i think in 5 years we made quite some changes and we are still learning and i think the concept is also changing so that is from uh, from start or maybe i just tell what my part is here so i helped establish this project at the beginning and my company is buying all of the all of the seats from this collection company process it and then sell it onwards uh, as a as a final product product a product and also pay pays the fair wild premium uh, to pay fair wild premium fund. So that's for now. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Um, I have questions to ask, but let's for now go on to Marin. And from your perspective, Marin, from Pucka, what you're juggling as you're sourcing in, in these and, and, and the pricing, but also the contracts and the long term, short termness of those aspects. Be great. Yeah. Thank you. <coughs> thank you, Anne and uh, Brian, for inviting me as well. And uh, for those who do not know Pucka, Pucka is an um, international herbal brand and we mostly focus on currently on herbal teas, organic herbal teas, and we use a number of Fairwild certified components. We uh, buy components from different countries um, and then we sell our teas around the world. And for us, what does Fairwild and sustainability mean is actually there are two ways when you talk about sustainability. First, it's sustainable from a business point of view. So it has to be sustainable as a business. And second, it has to be sustainable as a natural resource as well, or environment as well. And only when we have the two elements, sustainable business and sustainable environment, only then we can talk about thriving really and, and winning in, in, in every case. So when we talk about the supplier relationships, um, it has to be two way. You know, it has to be two way because if you have a relationship between two entities or two um, people, if you like, um, they both have to be happy with that. You know, if one is unhappy, then it does not work. And, and it's very important for us that we are happy with what we, we get. And also more importantly, our suppliers are happy with what they get from us. And something which is very important for us is that we want to make sure that um, wild collection in general is an appealing occupation because what we see is aging demographics and people move from full-time wild collection to part-time wild collection and with that uh, potentially they will be declining the wild collected species they will be um, declining availability we might get issues with stocks etc so we want to encourage people to see wild collection as a as a rewarding and appealing occupation rather than something which they can do just on the back of something else in the evenings or during the weekends. Um, when it comes to commitments, they have to be long-term commitments as well, because for us, we are organically certified in addition to the fact that we, we are fair wild certified. And by the way, I forgot to mention, we have been a fair wild supporter right from the beginning. Um, um, we have to give our suppliers at least three years projection in our volumes and in our demands because that's the only way they can ensure that um, they are planning of potential conversion of conventional crops into organic potential areas 
of conventional to organic is planned well ahead and they can meet our needs. The other thing as well is, which sometimes is misunderstood is the size of the operation. So today um, I'm representing PUCA, who is, I mentioned earlier, international business with nearly 100 million pound sales this year. But equally, I could be somebody who, as a customer, I could be somebody who is a startup business, uh, who I have just established my new brand today, tomorrow, um, and I'm looking for my suppliers who will supply raw materials for me to make what I want to make. And in these circumstances, PUCA currently, or our position is that we are usually better positioned when it comes uh, at looking at resources, knowledge, um, money, et cetera. But equally, you can flip it on the other way and, and look at somebody who is just a startup business. And in those circumstances, they will be actually not as well positioned as the suppliers and they will need support from their suppliers th 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 themselves. So here we are looking at mutually beneficial relationships and it goes both ways. It's not just from supplier to customer, from customer to supplier, they have to be both ways. When it comes to um, things like um, <clears throat> how do we build our relationships, um, it's very important for us that we have to be friends with our suppliers. And only when you are friend with somebody and when you have a really good relationship, then you can manage good times and bad times. And of course, we all have challenges sometimes. And uh, most of the time we are, we are all in good terms, but sometimes we do have problems. And only when you have a really good relationship with the supplier, only then um, resolved in the best possible way for every party, for everybody involved. And of course, in negotiations, there has to be a balance between availability of stock and lead times and payment terms and costs and sustainability, social impacts, the broader sustainability and environment, the business needs, the customer perceptions, and so on and so on and so on. And all those different pools that normally pull in different directions, they have to meet somewhere in a sweet spot that is suitable for everybody involved. Um, Something which I mentioned earlier is, is about the building of relationships. And, and this is very, very important for us. We spent a lot of time traveling abroad, not last year, obviously, and so far this year we have been stationed, but we spent a lot of time and effort traveling abroad and meeting our suppliers because only when you have met somebody face to face, when you have seen the operation, when you have engaged in, in them in a personal way, only then really you can appreciate and understand what are their challenges. What can you do to help them? Uh, how can you operate with them in the best possible way for them? So this is, this is something which is very important for us to engagement and, and really close engagement with our suppliers. Um, trust and transparency is very important. And again, in any relationship, trading or not, there need to be a degree of trust. And we operate on the degree, degree of trust and if suppliers have got a reasons for to tell us about particular cost increase, particular price of a particular product, that this year is this and next year is something else, then we're quite happy to talk to them about that and really explore what are, what are the opportunities and what are the challenges. And very often we find that there may be a challenge that's resolvable and we resolve it. And sometimes less often uh, there are challenges to resolve and we just have to move into a different space. Um, this was all which I was going to cover at this stage and I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions later on. We'll be happy to cover some of the questions. Great, thank you, Marin. And Jayant, would love to have you. And again, can you introduce what AERF and the project to position your comments? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Thank you for the invitation and I think um, very happy to see Marin and uh, <laughs> and, uh, and I think the people around who I mean I, I'm really uh, excited to see that so much of a response I mean attendance for this meeting, uh, which will uh, definitely means mainstream the fair wild <laughs> brand, I think which is which needs badly anyway. Coming back to uh, our intervention. It started with uh, the Applied Environmental Research Foundation, which is a conservation NGO. But if any, we wanted to do any business enterprise, we have to set up an enterprise. And so we set up a 
conservation enterprise called as Nature Connect way back in 2012, before even we started thinking about supply chains or anything. The reason behind setting up this enterprise was to create or establish a business case for biodiversity conservation. I think uh, the, the formation of Nature Connect and its philosophy behind setting up that enterprise definitely helped us uh, enter into the supply chain. Uh, this is obviously, uh, we, are, we are quite fortunate uh, that Paka Herbs uh, approached us and uh, you know to set up this first uh, fair wild certified supply chain in India uh, in way back in 2012. Uh, at the time, we were not knowing that this is going to happen or not, but it took about three years uh, and some support from, interestingly, importantly, from Darwin Initiative that we could set up the uh, India's two uh, fair wild certified value chains in way back in 2014. And I think since then, uh, we are in the seventh year and our volumes are growing. Uh, I would say that uh, our aim was not to, you know, look at the volumes that we are growing or how much business we are going to make. But our interest was that how much, uh, how this creates an impact, a uh, positive impact uh, for biodiversity conservation, because we operate uh, in the uh, Western Ghats, uh, Northern Western Ghats, where deforestation is a major challenge for conservation, because most of the forests that we have, they are outside the protected area network. And that area is significant. I mean, it's, uh, we are talking about uh, something around 21,000 square kilometers. Uh, so that that is a geographic spread. But if you look at the forest cover, uh, which is about around 50%, it used to be 50% in 2011. It must have come down to 40%. But even then, uh, that's not a small area. And uh, all these communities who are owning these forests, they depend on those forests for everything. And we need to make sure that these forests remain, you know, for future and for all its ecosystem services that we talk about. And we were struggling to find out how we are going to do this. We cannot purchase this forest. We, it is impossible to buy uh, forests or, you know, evacuate people from their land. But how do we create a relationship uh, of these people with nature, which is not only healthy or economically profitable for people, but also for nature itself. And I think Fairwild uh, certification definitely helped uh, us achieve those objectives. And I can thank Pakahas 100 times for <laughs> being our really solid uh, partners because you need, you know, certification in isolation has got no meaning. Uh, and uh, so their commitment uh, towards purchase of all this certified material in addition to that, they were also, uh, they invested in certification costs, which is a major barrier for any small, enterprise, we have grown and we can think of, you know, uh, supporting this. But I think one of the important lessons, uh, I would say, or other learnings for us from Fairwild Certification approach to, to livelihoods and conservation is that uh, the entire medicinal plant sector in India, India is one of probably uh, one of the top three exporters of medicinal plants, and it is still mostly unorganized, completely secretive, and there is no, absolutely no clue who is buying what and what is it used for? And we were completely surprised when we saw that even the communities who have been collecting, for example, Haritaki for 300 years, they did not know what is the end product of this, of the fruit. And uh, I mean, you know, you can always, uh, this is, I'm going to make some contradictory comments here. Basically, people think that, you know, indigenous people know everything, but <laughs> they get exploited at the end. Uh, but uh, you see that they have no clue. And though the market was reaching up, I mean, the traders were coming to their place and buying all these fruits, but they were not knowing what is the food is going to use for. So I think this whole uh, project, I mean, I won't call it a project anymore. It's a business uh, since we are operating for last seven years. And I think our volumes are also growing very big. We are about to, uh, I mean, last two years, we are in uh, black in my opinion. And so, uh, a is that they understood uh, what the value chain is because we are processing the entire material where the resource is. We are not taking the entire material from A point to where people will not see what is happening. I think we wanted to make uh, see that that they understand the change and they can see the change happening in front of their eyes. Uh, it, it has a lot of other uh, benefits, mainly you, is, there are a lot of uh, saving and transport costs, but more and more, more importantly, you gain trust of communities. You know, indigenous people, obviously, they're always suspicious about someone coming outside 
though we are a non-profit and we have been working in this uh, landscape for 25 years, that doesn't change much when you start talking about money and their their resources. You know, then suddenly they think differently. And I think this approach that we took and it was helpful because then that is how you establish transparency that the resource is where and the resource, you know, the entire, I wouldn't call it a value addition. It is a value transformation that is taking place where the where the resource area is. And I think another important benefit uh, is uh, of their wild certification protocol. It is one of the strangest, stringent protocols uh, ever that we have come across. And I think it is still the most uh, stringent. And I think that that is required. Uh, is that the indigenous people who were not having access, you know, they were, they were having the rights to collect, but they were not knowing what are the boundaries of their own land. So they, because fair wild certification is makes it mandatory that you need to fix the ownership. You cannot be collecting from some area which do not know who is the owner. And in a protected area situation, uh, uh, situation like in India, where there is always conflict over who owns what piece of land. And I think we made a, a significant contribution besides whatever happens to the project that all the collectors who are now, we started with six collectors in Bhima Shankar Wildlife Sanctuary. There are now 25 collectors and all their land parcels are now marked and the, the 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 papers bear their name and not in collaboration with the forest department or in collaboration with the government where you know it's a it's it's a collaborative i mean it's a basically uh, the resources shared so this i would say uh, and this will never be reported in any you know scientific uh, but it, this is a major outcome of this uh, uh, for this for this initiative and uh, and that is why more and more indigenous people are actually now uh, even in other areas are approaching because they they have huge resources of Arutaki. i mean but they are this is the only example where people have not only seen economic benefits but they have seen that the the entire business operation is conducted in the most transparent manner and they have not only access to the resource but they have also got the ownership of their land i don't think that there is any parallel to this, uh, you know, contribution of certification uh, to such such issues <laughs> in countries like India. So I stop here, and I think because we'll have more to discuss later. Thank you, Jayant. And just for those in the audience, there are two videos on the Sustainable Herbs Program website that focus on different parts of the work that Jayant's doing that help bring it to life. One with the social economic aspects, and then the other, the more biodiversity side. Um, I want to so go around with another round and maybe go back to you, Bryony, and really, so you've been involved in implementing this for X number of years. What do you see as the key challenges that you're focusing on right now, what you've learned and what feels most important um, to address and try and move forward? Yeah, well, I guess, um... I have an, an interesting role here because obviously I'm not involved in the trade itself as a representative of, of the standing set, standard setting initiative. We help provide a framework in which you know, these trade relationships can take place and we set certain requirements in discussion and collaboration with, with all the stakeholders who are involved. Um, yeah, I guess, I mean, things that are really challenging um, I think well work towards really yeah really building the costs of, of doing sustainable harvesting well into um, the business operation is always challenging I mean we often see so we have the fair wild premium fund for example which is really a ring fenced amount that should be spent on social um, development priorities in the first couple of years, it can be used to support some of the setup costs of Fairwild and um, also some of the, the sustainable harvesting improvements. But of course, that is something that can, can come under pressure in later years of the scheme because the companies are trying to set up these harvest management plans from, from scratch often, and they realize that they don't, they, I mean, it does quite a lot to, to set that up and um, 
they don't always have the funds to build that in upfront. So sometimes they come back and say, can we keep using the premium fund on that? And we have to be quite strict and say, no, really that, that fund is for these other priorities. What you need to do is to go and negotiate also with the, the buyer and see maybe, and maybe build those costs into the um, trade relationship. Um, and you know, sometimes that's a struggle to do because these, these costs have not always been internalized in the, the market price of those ingredients. Um, but I think the, the buyer can also contribute a lot. And we've really seen companies support a lot on technical aspects of setting up Fair Wild. So actually helping with doing resource assessments and management funds. So there's a lot of technical expertise that can also be exchanged between companies. And that's always great to see as well. But I think it's also made me reflect on, well, these trade partnerships, they are between the industry actors, but you actually also need a lot of other parties involved as well. So what is the, the role of the local government in, in helping with sustainable harvesting? Of, often we've put these responsibilities to the, the companies involved because there is no government you know, man, managing the harvest. Um, but there are, there are other actors and, and people and organizations that should also be responsible in actually helping these sustainable trading relationships take place. Um, yeah, I think that's probably the points I'd make. The other thing, I, just to pick up on a few things that other people mentioned, Marin talked a bit about the, the power dynamics and the fact that it can be the buyer who has maybe more, more power in a relationship, maybe they're setting the price. But not always. They also might be a relatively new business. They also need the supplier maybe better set up and better positioned. Um, but what we've also seen is a lot of these ingredients are becoming increasingly scarce in the market. Um, there's a lot of demand for herbal ingredients. It's, it's outstripping in a lot of cases the resources that are available. So often the suppliers actually probably have more power than they realize actually they they have an increasingly scarce resource and they could also be negotiating more strongly in these cases um, but then it, there's also limits placed on how much you know how much the the market can afford to pay more before passing those costs on to the, the consumer which may put them in a, in a weaker position in terms of actually being able to be profitable and sell their products so just a few reflections, sorry, slightly roundabout. No, that's great, yeah. I'll stop there. Peter, oh, were you done? Yeah, Peter, I'd love you to continue and you could, you know, reflect on what has been said and also sort of where, what you've learned and what you're really focused on in addressing this, this balance of making sure you have a voice and that the collectors from whom you're harvesting have a voice and that dynamic. Um, okay, um, so um, I'm kind of in between everybody. Uh, so uh, we are a trader, we are a processor, we are helping uh, collectors a bit with administ administ administrative stuff. On the other hand, we are, we are helping the buyer, so I'm in between everyone. Um, what to say, what have I learned? Well, the thing is there is a big jump from organic which is maybe like, let's say, uh, basics uh, to fair wild certification. Because when you enter fair wild, you have, to, you, you, you have to think about people and you have to think about how to construct everything to be easier on the collectors, to be easier on the community there. And it is not always the easiest thing to do. Because for example, if we are talking about fair wild funds, uh, there is about 5,000 euros which our company pays a year into that fair wild uh, fund. Uh, and when we asked collectors how they want to do it, they just said, give us the money. You know, they would prefer give us the money. We can buy, uh, I don't know, clothes, <laughs> whatever. Uh, and of course, you have to say, you can't do that. We have to do something for the community. Okay, then buy us a car, you know, or something like that. So you have to a bit be like, uh, I wouldn't want to say a parent, but maybe a, a guide in a way uh, to, to guide them to, 
to say what you can do, and then you have to, of course, ask Fairwild if you are correct there. Uh, so we started a bit at the beginning. We didn't know how to do it. Later on, we did we did a board because at the beginning we we were trying to get 150 collectors, I think, altogether to make one big meeting. And this is practically impossible because you must know that people are living in the hills. Uh, they don't have cars and so on. So it's very hard to get 100 people together. Uh, so we made the board of collectors. So you have four or five people to talk to and it's easier then. So we are, we are transforming in a way. Uh, and later on, for example, we had a beautiful uh, thing renovating a kindergarten. Um, but again, you have, to, you have to learn, you have to adapt, you have to see what you have with the people. And I think that is the biggest difference between fair wild and let's, let's say organic. You add the components of people which you have in front of you, you have to work with them. Uh, and there is a lot of documentation also to prove that you're doing that. Um, when I see here uh, in, the, in the comments, I also noticed uh, about endangered species. This is also very, uh, uh, very big thing uh, when, when you talk about fair wild, about, about uh, flora, right? So I'm doing, uh, uh, I'm doing a lot with essential oils and in the Balkans we had a, a helichrysum rush, for example, it was about 10 years ago. What happened? Uh, uh, U.S. Uh, aromatherapists started using a lot of helichrysum, and there was a shortage in the market, and everybody started collecting helichrysum. And very soon, the whole of uh, Croatia was out of helichrysum. There was like no of it. It was totally destroyed. The habitats were totally destroyed. I think it took it took it took the plant about five to ten years to grow back. Now it is okay, but in one year or two years, the habitats were destroyed. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to monitor each year how much you can collect. You're, you're looking at the year, what is it going to be? And we are also enlarging the area where we can collect. Luckily, in Serbia, a lot of the land is owned by government. So it is quite easier, easy to get a permission to collect on the government land. You have to pay the, the fines, but still, it's quite easier. So there are many issues. And I don't know, and perhaps if you, if you, if you give me some... Um, uh, yeah, the herb was uh, the herb was helichrysum, helichrysum italicum in Latin. So, if you have any questions, maybe it's easier to talk it over question per question than to just speak in ger generally. Um, well, I want to thank you. Um, I and mean, what I heard from you is both the challenges of working. The premium fund seems like. Uh, challenging thing to navigate and negotiate, as well as the second point of the importance of a fair wild, some kind of certification around harvesting and over harvesting, that there is that need. And But Marin, I would love, since you've been involved in different way places negotiating the premium fund, curious what lessons you've learned from that and what you're taking as you move forward? If you were starting, say, a new fair wild project, what lessons would you bring into navigating that? Yeah, I mean, I was making some notes while um, the other panelist was speaking. And uh, one of the things which I, I think it's important for everybody to understand is the element of education. And this is education for the consumers first, or the consumers of those herbal products, and also the education to, for the collectors as well, the collectors of the herbal products, because we often, and John was very interesting because he made the comment that people sometimes collect certain things and they don't even know what they, they go for. Um, so here, uh, it is very important we, we drive that education because only when the consumers are fully aware of the challenges and the issues and the benefits of a particular herb or collection procedure, then only then they can value it in the right way. And when we talk about value, people generally assume or expect that all the food products are really cheap because we can very easily go in supermarkets and we can buy food uh, that is the expectation is to be very very cheap and and this is a challenge really because uh, because of that expectation from all the consumers that everything you eat is basically uh, going to be very very cheap um, this is also driven into the wild collection as well so here we've got an education piece that we all have to do and also in terms of standard, promoting the standards. Um, when we think about it, fair wild is a standard, but really it's more than that. It's the standard because it provides the framework 
for a particular operation and people then know, operators know what they can do and what they can't do. Um, so they, they are sustainable in, in, in a better way. But equally fair wild is a brand in a way because it has got the logo and consumers may or may not have a certain affinity to that brand and decide to support it or not. So here we also need to talk about how can fair wild as a, as a logo be promoted to consumers uh, and to collectors as well, either side of the spectrum. So then people become more interested and they get to value materials and products that have got the fair wild logo, for example. One thing which, um, which is interesting, Anne, and you mentioned about the premiums, and I agree with Peter, and I'm sure Jant will share that as well. When you go to collectors and say, you know, we have this money, um, tell us what you want to do with it. Uh, yes, the answer is just give us the money. This is, this is basically the, the most common answer. And, and again, this is a piece of education to me as well, again because we here have to start talking to people that they need to self-care, they need to be able to self-care. It is very easy when somebody gives you the money and then you do with the money whatever they tell you, tell you to do, whatever you think you should do. But here, how can you create something that spend the money today in a way that you benefit not only tomorrow, but the next year and the following year and the following year. So this is very, very important. And we have to respect people's wishes. So sometimes the ideas that come through as far as the premium fund are rather interesting, I would say, um, but we have to respect the, the wishes and the needs for the collectors and what, what they want to do with this. And it's very interesting because Fair Wild actually does not have a geographical scope. So here we can have a Fair Wild certified operator in countries like India um, or um, um, places like uh, perhaps Africa maybe, or um, other countries that need more infrastructure and more support. But equally, we could have fair wild uh, operations which are in Europe. And it is somewhat easier to go to a collector, collector's um, assembly or operation uh, in developing countries or countries where there is more need for infrastructure. Um, and the questions there on what the premium is needed are much easier to answer. Whereas if you go in Europe, uh, where, for example, in Bulgaria or Poland or Hungary, some of the countries that we work with, people were generally well provisioned because they've got the social security, they've got the education, they've got sanitation, all their basic needs are met. Uh, and, and when you then go and say, right, tell me now what you want to do with this money, the question is very interesting because then, then the dynamic is very, very different. It's very unlike what the answers you get from collectors communities in India, perhaps, or in Africa or some, somewhere else. So this is very in interesting. And again, we as the customer can only give feedback. We cannot, we cannot decide for the collectors what they want to spend the money on or how much that fund is going to be. And in the past, we have felt that a premium fund is not sufficient. And we, have topped, uh, we will top up this with additional funding. So perhaps the operation is very small and the amount of herbs that we buy from that particular operation is so small that the premium generated also is very small. And in these cases, we'll go and say, well, actually we will provide extra funding for a particular thing, but you tell us what you want to, uh, to have the funding on. So these are the different ways when we can kind of influence or provide um, for the fair wild premiums. And of course, in Pucker, we also have our sustainability fund as well, which is separate to the uh, fair trade premiums that we drive, uh, uh, generate through the Fair Wild and Fair for Life um, certification schemes. And here with the Pucker Sustainability Fund, we can, it is Pucker, it is our decision where we want to invest and where we want to put the money. And sometimes we have examples where a particular wild collection operation would have said, okay, we would like to do this, but we don't have enough money. And we will then top up that money from our sustainability fund. So this is over and above what we would normally do um, uh, with that particular operation. Yes, I hope I have answered the question and uh, um, on the kind of on the pricing and the money and the premiums. And it's yes, it is always very interesting conversation, as you can tell. Um, it, it it can be very straightforward sometimes. 
or it can sometimes sometimes be challenging. And I mentioned earlier, we just very often have to work with the suppliers to understand exactly what the challenge is. And sometimes those challenges are resolvable and sometimes they're not. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that attention to the context. Um, and Jayan, I want to turn to you now. And what struck me in your comments before and also in visiting the projects in the Western Ghats was there's meeting the fair wild certification and then there's these unintended consequences like the land ownership comment you made before or observing the training that people in the community are getting that they wouldn't have. That's another way of getting skills that they can then take regardless of their involvement. So I'm curious anyways for you to reflect on what's been said but speak also to this navigating, making sure the operators needs are met, the, the collectors needs are met, that power dynamic. Uh I think there are two uh, important, uh, you know, contributions of fair wild certification uh, initiative. I won't call it as project again. Uh, is that we uh, also build the capacity, uh, you know, of fair wild auditing in India. That helped us uh, to get, uh, you know, uh, train auditors who speak the language of the collectors. And that has actually, um, that has also brought necessary change uh, in the perception of what is expected from the collectors. And I think, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, certification uh, helps us to, to not only bring transparency, but also build capacity of the local community, irrespective of you know, which background they are. Uh, when we started with indigenous communities, they are the most difficult one in terms of uh, educating, I mean, education basically uh, documentation because they uh, they believe in, in a particular way of continuing their practices and their traditions are generally oral. So uh, I think that this is this effort, this particular initiative has helped us to start documenting what they do. And uh, now in last five years, we have reached a stage where we don't have to, you know, we. I don't have to go there and monitor everything and whatever we are getting is a it's a very nice reporting and it has been not just audited by uh, by fair wild auditors but there have been uh, third party audits of our project because we have been getting support for this initiative to various funding agencies so that it not only sustains but it grows and all of their audit reports have said that uh, the community uh, understanding and how they maintain the records of the entire process. I think they are, it's, it's remarkable. So this is one of the important outcomes of this, uh, uh, this initiative. And I think one of the things that Brian has said about the, that local governments need to do something about sustainable harvesting, I would like to say something about that, that how we are using the fair wild certification protocol and use the overlap between the Biodiversity Act. You know, we, we talk a lot about the Nagoya protocol and access and benefit sharing mechanism. But probably I, I, I can say that with a lot of pride that we are the only organization right now in India uh, who has done the, uh, you know, the audit of our supply chain using the ABS mechanism. And this was supported by uh, German Technical Cooperation. But the point is that they saw that, that the way we are, we are con you know, conducting the business and the way we are maintaining it records and you see the transparency up to the last, uh, you know, to, to the last bag. Uh, this is very much what uh, ABS wants. You know, the Nagoya protocol actually uh, demands this. And I think fair wild certification is one of the, and so we are now, we have been working with the state biodiversity board with the national biodiversity authority. And we are also working with the uh, biodiversity management committees, which at the local level, which have got the highest powers and we are, Building their capacity so that they become part of the part of this fair wild project, and they are aware uh, that there, this premium can be used for manage also used for management of the resource, which is certified. It is not necessarily every time that uh, communities need to uh, enjoy this money for their own benefit. Because for us, conservation is equally important as community benefits, as far as the fair wild and overall our approach is concerned. So we always make sure that the premium is also used for uh, sustainable management of the resource that is uh, certified. And that, that is uh, happening more in the Sangameshwar area where we have all these sites 
uh, where the uh, our focus is conservation uh, of flagship species such as great hornbill. I think that is so. so this is a, there is a multifaceted, uh, you know, the, the so much there in the in these two value chains that is still hidden. I'm I can probably talk over five years, but still uh, I won't be able to tell you that how much uh, uh, you know. You have so much, so many things in terms of impact, in terms of the nuances of right from how you come engage with communities to linkage with markets. You know how basically take the entire local supply chain to the global market. I do not see any, I, I still don't know of any example right now that is there uh, in India, South Asia. I mean, that's really, uh, it A is remarkable, but also uh, a reflection of that why big companies are <laughs> not doing it because they don't want transparency. They don't want uh, equitable benefit. I mean, what we're talking about is they do not want mutual, mutually beneficial relationship. I mean, this is really sad, but uh, unfortunately, it is true. Thank you, Dan. Um, I appreciate both your closing, your final statement, but also the sense, again, that it's a journey of learning and accomplishing certain things at the beginning and each step along the way. Um, there are different challenges and opportunities. Now, I'd love to invite Christina and then Elizabeth to make some comments and questions. And then Bryony, Peter, and Marin, and Giant, I'm going to invite you to respond. So um, you can just raise your hand once they're done if you want to respond to a specific point. So Christina, would you like to start? Great. Thank you so much, Anne, and the organizers, and everyone who's spoken. I've learned so much uh, just now. Um, I'm going to offer a, a perspective from Indigenous peoples. Um, it's a bit alternative, but it also picks up some of the threads that have been mentioned already. Um, so I've been working with Indigenous peoples for many years, and some of this thinking really originates from Latin America, from Peru, from the Andes in Peru, and the Potato Park, which is this um, Indigenous territory um, where they have a huge diversity of potatoes, but they also have, you know, wild, wild plants, lots of medicinal plants, and, you know, in this context, as in many other indigenous contexts, the objectives are very much, um, you know, economic development, but, but in a way that's supporting the environment and supporting their culture and their heritage and their self-determination and land rights. So these are all really important in these, in these contexts with indigenous peoples. Um, and we know that, you know, uh, most of the world's biodiversity is located on indigenous people's lands and territories and um, these cover about a quarter of the world's land surface um, and um, we heard from IPBES in 2019 the intergovernmental panel on ecosystem services and biodiversity that um, did this big global biodiversity assessment that the biodiversity levels um, on indigenous territories are greater and as it, biodiversity is declining less on indigenous territories than on other lands. So that's a really significant finding and it points to the importance of traditional knowledge um, and indigenous management systems, um, in, um, indigenous ways of, of sustainable harvesting. So in the context of these indigenous territories, um, the view on, on sort of, you know, wild harvesting and, and trade in wild plants, um, it, the, the view has been quite a lot focused on, well, how can they capture the most benefits um, in their territory? Um, because they don't want to produce, mass produce, they don't want to over harvest, you know, their territories are maybe 1,000 to 10,000 hectares. So they can't produce a huge quantity and they're often, um, you know, subsistence farmers as well. So they don't have time to be full-time plant traders. So, so the question is, so equity for them, fair trade for them is really um, ideally having a direct relationship with a, a manufacturer or even better being able to add value themselves um, so that, you know, most of the, the economic value stays with them. But it really isn't being at the bottom of a long 
global value chain where they get very little and they have very little control over the market, very little knowledge of the market. Um, so in this context, quite often, you know, actually local and regional markets are as important, if not more important than and appealing um, as the global markets, which can be difficult for them to, to um, control and, and engage in. Um, and secondly, a, a really important objective, as I said, is, is conserving their natural resource base, their biodiversity, sustainably using it. And thirdly, it's, it's um, ensuring that their traditional knowledge and their cultural values are respected in these relationships. So, um, you know, in the Andes, um, there are some really important values that guide all aspects of life. Um, so these are reciprocity, which means equal exchange uh, in society, but also with nature, uh, balance uh, with nature and solidarity in society. So helping those in need and also collectiveness. Um, you know, they, they don't see ownership in the same way as we do. Um, so relationships with the land, relationships with resources, um, even the way they view their traditional knowledge, it's very much collective heritage that's to be passed on to future generations. Uh, so that's important in terms of business models, um, you know, having sort of my collective micro enterprises. Um, and um, the other thing is, the, the, um, the aim to sustain biodiversity also links with having multiple products and so not just investing in one type of product, maybe tea, but having a range of products that use different wild plants or even some crops, you know. Um, so when it comes to labeling, you know, the idea for them is, is better to have a territorial label than to have to apply for a different label for each different product that they have. And that's been in the potato park, um, you know, labeling has been an quite cumbersome. They tried to apply for a collective tra trademark, um, but it was too difficult for bureaucratic reasons, um, even with support from an NGO. Um, and they also, um, you know, a, a key concern with labeling and certification is really um, to recognize traditional knowledge um, and culture as an explicit criteria, and not all certification schemes have that but also that the criteria, the rules for harvesting, for conservation, for who can use the label, reflect their cultural values. And they really, you know, strengthen them rather than being something based on Western values and legal systems that is imposed on them. And then, you know, can contribute to their erosion and therefore to the erosion of biodiversity. So, um, after this experience, um, this community in, in Peru, but also a group of partners we work with in India, um, China and Kenya and other countries, uh, we've been thinking about maybe trying to establish a, an alternative label for biocultural heritage based products, which indigenous peoples design. Um, so they set the criteria and they manage it, but that has some third party verification to, you know, to give it some credibility. Obviously the challenge there is, is how to fund it because, you know, there isn't a big private company involved or, so this is the sort of thing that we're, we're grappling with at the moment. Um, and I think I'll leave it there for now. Thank you. Great, thank you, Christina. And for bringing in those cultural values, I especially appreciate um, Elizabeth allowed you to layer on and then Turn it back. Great. Um, I'm learning a lot and really inspired and happy to be included in this conversation. So thank you so much um, for um, asking for my reflections. Um, my research is on sustainability standards more broadly and on the fair trade movement more broadly. So um, my comments kind of intend to put this in a broader context. And the fair trade movement has been around since, um, as we know it today, has been around since 1945 um, and also focuses a lot on smallholders and has been the site of a lot of innovation. Um, and my work is focused on coffee, um, which is, of course, a global commodity, 
um, cannabis in the Pacific Northwest or the new legal uh, marijuana market, and then also clothing, which is manufactured globally. Um, so I have some insights that come from those that might be helpful for this community, or my, my hope is that they're, they're of use. Um, something I've seen in, in those industries, um, even cannabis, which has this very, very short lifetime of only being legal a couple of years, um, is that there seems to be a pendulum in initiatives like this uh, between two extremes. And on one side, um, on one extreme, a very relationship-based trade of that's based on collaboration and trust and um, interpersonal relationships and, and spending time together. And at the other end of the pendulum or the other extreme is standardization, bureaucratization, control, transparency, and monitoring. Um, and in the fair trade movement, we've, we've seen a shift from in the very early years in the 1940s, solidarity trade about relationships and one-on-one -on -one collaboration and a movement to bigger alternative trade and then going all the way to the extreme of fair trade labeling and then sustainability labeling and then just sort of labeling for the sake of labeling. Um, and then the pendulum swinging back, especially we see in coffee, which is the site of a lot of innovation toward direct trade and relationship trade and profit sharing. Um, so, so thinking about the diversity of, of what types of innovations are available on that spectrum from relationship and trust based to control standardization and bureaucracy based. Um, a challenge that I often think about is how do we take the best of both worlds of that extreme and try to leave the, the challenges of both of those worlds uh, behind. So I think it, when times are good, when prices are good, when the environment's doing things we hope it might do, uh, we see uh, for both of those ends of the extreme, the ability to create shared value or this idea that um, working together, um, well, for the, for the relationship collaboration and trust small end of the spectrum, um, there's an opportunity for the sum of the parts, um, for the whole to be greater than the sum of the parts. Um, so the collaboration that happens creates shared value and all parties, the buyers and suppliers are getting more than they would otherwise, everyone is benefiting. Um, when things are really good for the other end of the spectrum and standards and control and monitoring, we see um, both buyers and suppliers making lots of investments, um, getting a lot out of those investments, getting knowledge, access to steady supply chains, long-term contracts, getting higher prices and a lot of benefits coming out. Um, but in times when things aren't so good, and a lot of um, several of the speakers pointed out to um, moments when things get really challenging um, is, is when the rubber meets the road, um, then we start to see some more zero sum thinking of if buyers win, then suppliers lose and suppliers lose and buyers win and everybody can't win all the time. And in those moments, I see um, the most important things that fair trade can do start to fall out um, because they're the most difficult things. And the things that don't matter so much become really easy and second nature. So we've seen this um, research is showing that across voluntary standards globally, um, when prices get low and competition becomes rigorous, the most important goals that certifications have become watered down and diluted and marginalized and other things start to take their place. So when things are challenging for the relationship, trust, collaboration, small end of the spectrum, um, I've, I've seen in research shows that um, in those trade relationships, there's a lot of defaulting to traditional power dynamics. Um, even when demand is high and suppliers have more bargaining power than they usually do, they often don't have the information they need to understand and negotiate as well as their actual positions might allow them to. So we see a, a defaulting to um, traditional capitalist labor or owner investor um, supplier relations. And for um, the big standardization and control end of the spectrum, when things get challenging, um, we see that suppliers can't sell all of their product at ethical prices, um, that the prices they receive don't cover the cost of certification, that they can't get the information and capacity building they need in order to improve quality and compete. 
And we see it watered down to just auditing and control instead of an actual relationship. So all of this to say, um, if we were to think about um, interventions and supply chains with fairness at the core as being a spectrum from good, really good, healthy relationships between two people to standardization, bureaucratization, and control to make sure that those relationships are doing what we say and hope they do, um, then taking the best worlds means imagining in the worst of times when it's a zero sum game between parties, um, what will happen to those relationships? And um, what my research kind of focuses on is the idea that in those moments, focusing on power sharing is super important. And that means sharing of who is responsible, who bears the risk and who gets the reward. And there are some great examples of certifications that have moved toward power sharing. Um, Fairtrade International um, about five years ago um, brought producers back to the board of directors, gave their members assembly more votes, um, suppliers in the members assembly more votes. Um, we see in coffee an emerging of a, a profit sharing model that shares rewards in ways that we haven't seen before. Um, so in posing a question uh, back to the panelists, um, my question to you might be, um, when things are challenging in those really difficult times, when it feels like a zero sum between buyers and suppliers, um, what strategies have you deployed or what ideas do you have for how to keep fairness at the center and how to come back to the principle of power of sharing, how to share responsibility, risk and reward and not go to either of the negative places that certifications can take us or relationships can take us when, when things get really challenging. I wonder, do one of you all wanna speak or I would be inclined to maybe ask Mar Marin first, but if Peter or Jan, you yeah, wanna- Yeah, I kind of felt that was coming my way. Thank you, Elizabeth. <laughs> um, it's very interesting and um, you're totally right. I mean, there's those extremes, which um, I mentioned, we tend to be more in the friends environment, the one extreme, which is more to do with, you know, if you're a friend with somebody and if you're a really good relationship, then when times get really hard, uh, even at the hardest times, you can, you can resolve challenges. If you're into a tra very transactional type of relationship, which is basically, this is the contract. I give you the purchase order. You give me the price. You send me the invoice. I then pay you. You then ship the goods. That sort of relationship, all that ability to understand the challenges and resolve them is lost because it, it is very mechanical and it's very transactional indeed. Now, we do have fair trade contracts or fair wild contracts. And to a degree, they provide that framework and they identify who is responsible for what and who bears the risk and who bears the costs, even if there is a challenge, etc. And contracts and fair for life contracts are not always easy to negotiate. They're not always easy to agree. And they normally take long, long time and long conversations. And actually, by the time you complete the negotiation of a contract, just take a step back and they're like, did we really have to do all that? Because we actually effectively, we agreed what we have to do but now we have to put it on a paper. So I think, I think generally, I'm certainly of the conviction that if you get it into somebody's heart, um, you're gonna get into their head as well. So we sometimes talk about this polarity of, is it head or is it heart? And, and very important for us is that we have to have the relationship with the suppliers and we have to be um, in good terms with them all the times. And of course we have challenges, of course we have product non-compliances, of course, we have safety issues. Of course, we might have availability issue. There may be a cost issue as well. And, and they all have to be resolved. They all have to be resolved in a way that, that we actually can continue to operate. And what's important for us also is that it'd be very easy for us to go into a, an extreme space where we can basically exploit some particular collector's community or supplier or resource. But how long would that go for? because eventually they will collapse and eventually they will, they will basically perish. And who is then going to be the next supplier for us? Who will then, how are we going to build our business to maintain uh, availability of products that we want to provide to our consumers? So I think 
I mentioned earlier, sustainability is not just about the environmental sustainability, it's about conducting business in a sustainable way. And that is something which is very important. Um, but yeah, I, I think having contracts where you basically put down a piece of paper who is responsible for what and who is not responsible for um, certain things and hope that those contracts never come out of the draw because if the time that those contracts come out of the draw and are put on the table and it's like, all right, let's just have a look now here. What did we agree? It means you are not going to that productive space. You know, if you have to refer to a contract um, means that there is something going on and you have to take a different approach. Thank you, Maren. Peter, do you want to chime in from your perspective? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. So the thing is that um, even though we are equal in this uh, in this uh, relationship, some partners are more equal than, <laughs> equal than the other. So of course, it is the final buyer who is more powerful here, like in any relationship. And we must know then that this still is business. We are doing... Uh, in big collection, we are collecting 40,000 uh, tons of seeds. This is about 150 tons uh, to, four, to 200 tons of fresh rose hips. So this is a business. Uh, people depend on it. So you still have to do it business-like. And uh, as told, main, main ball is on the side of the final buyer who either decides to do it a uh, fair way or doesn't want to do it. Uh, when we started, we made that quite clear with our partners that if uh, they want to do that, we can go and we can create this fair wild story. And I think everything was quite clear at the beginning. It took some time. It, it took a lot of negotiation. And once we cleared that out, uh, things started moving. And we had a lot of obstacles. We had uh, we, we had to change some, some things about the transportation and so on. Then Brexit, uh, Brexit kicked in. Then uh, uh, Ch Chilean, uh, Chileans produced uh, much cheaper oil than, than, than we could because they had a good year. So there were many obstacles along the way. And because I think we started on a good terms at the beginning, we were able to we were we were able to fix that we were we were able to fix everything so i agree with marin here that the relationships are the key okay great and jayan i would love for you to add and also wanted to pick back up on christina's point around the different cultural encounters in a global supply network because you're on the ground in India where there's very different values around plants and the nature and the world and how you navigate that and what you see as the key threads or issues there. Yeah, I think uh, one important uh, contribution, again, I mean, how uh, we have tried to, uh, I think the Fairwild Standard Protocol uh, has helped us uh, in many ways. Uh, because it also uh, has one particular provision to respect, uh, you know, local cultural practices. You know, you cannot use a resource which is precious uh, for, I mean, which is culturally important. Uh, but, you know, uh, cultures are also facing threats. We need to understand that if some practice has to sustain, the ecosystem has to sustain. I mean, in, in absence of an ecosystem, the cultural practices do not make sense in my opinion. Because uh, otherwise, uh, what is to be uh, worshipped? I mean, if you are not, uh, there is no forest. What is the point of uh, worship of God in the forest? So, uh, I mean, coming to the theme of you know uh, that the, the the traditional practice of conservation, which is called as sacred groves, uh, is facing immense threat in in the northern western guards, while in the southern western guards, these sacred groves are actually under the control of forest departments. So there is absolutely uh, there's absolutely no role of the communities to manage this resource. So the, the Northern Western Guards where we are working, the sacred groves have, have a huge uh, density and distribution and they are culturally important spaces for communities. But people were chopping down big trees and then they're building temples. So if you want to worship something uh, and there are some gods uh, without any temples, how do you maintain uh, the value of those ecosystems? And I think uh, we have tried to use Fairwild certification approach 
to even conserve those ecosystems because even now, I mean, not now, but I think about 10 years ago or 15 years ago, people started uh, valuing money for their practices. And this is true. So, uh, so when we started using Fairwild certification as one of the approaches for saving those ecosystems, we started purchasing all the fruits from those large trees, which were there uh, in, the, in, the, in the sacred groves. But there were also trees which were worshipped and which were supposed to be chopped down, which do not produce any fruits, but still are now protected because of certification. So this is another unique example in my opinion, because I call it unique because uh, I, I have not come across anything similar where a certification scheme can protect uh, something which is culturally and socially important. Uh, so those trees were about to be chopped down and they are still standing. And I, uh, though they do not produce fruit, I think for us, that is important, that something that you can protect using monetary, uh, which has got no value for the communities. I think uh, this is an uh, intangible uh, benefit of certification uh, so far as so, so far for the uh, cultural aspect, but I would like to conclude that uh, we started with uh, certifying, we started in 2015 when we were certified, we had, uh, you know, submitted that uh, in our protocol profile that we will be certifying about six sacred groves uh, and about, you know, some 500 large trees of Tarimina labellica in last six years, we have, that number has gone to 22. So we are now actively protecting uh, 22 sacred groves and managing those uh, using the fair wild certification. Though there is a lot of other things that you need to do, but I think uh, with certification, we are not only respecting the cultural uh, and the social practices of local communities, but also are offering them the economic incentive that they have been looking at. I mean, they have been, uh, you know, aspiring for for a long time. And uh, uh, if if there is there is a growing demand, and we will be then certifying more than 100 sacred groves because we have around 2,000 sacred groves in the Ratnagiri district alone. Uh, though obviously all the sacred groves do not have the target species, but I think we can definitely take our, uh, you know, this particular approach to scale. Now coming back to this very different question of that, what do you do when things go uh, turn bad or go wrong or the market is not responding to you? I think uh, one of the lessons that I've learned and I have not shared that with <laughs> Marine as of yet, that uh, as a being a, you know, when you decided that you are in a business, you know, you need to also understand the basic uh, tricks of business that you cannot be dependent on one, on one buyer or you cannot be having only two value chains and survive as a business. You need to diversify. You need to diversify your, your products. You need to look at other market opportunities because I think what this certification has taught us it has actually provided us uh, insights, uh, you know, how to access markets, you know, how to work with brands such as Paka Herbs. And I think we should be using those learnings and developing, uh, you know, brands for our, our own products in the native market or even other markets where you use different certification schemes, which are probably uh, not as strict or as they are not maybe also required for other supply chains. But I think, uh, and that is how you balance uh, your, your supply chain, you diversify your supply chain so that your relationship with, with your current buyers is not overstrained. You can always assume that there will be one day when probably Pakka Hurts will not uh, buy from us. So where do we go? I mean, we are, we are not here to say that, no, no, our business is ended. I mean, that's the end of the business. No, that's not the thing. So you need to really look at that, what will sustain your business and what are the learning from certification and how you can expand uh, this your business model, uh, uh, you know, and and grow. Great, thank you all. And Brian, I wanted to invite you to as the fair wild speaker. <laughs> sure, I mean, the, key this has been such a fascinating conversation, and thank you so much to everyone. And it's also been really interesting to hear Elizabeth and Christina's thoughts about it as well. So. Thank you, Elizabeth, for showing us where we really don't want to go with Fairwild as well. This nightmare scenario of price pressure, competition, zero sum relationships between suppliers and buyers, and then standard systems focused on box ticking bureaucracy. So it just makes me think, let's just hope that pendulum is swinging in a good direction and let's all make it really, really work. 
And it just makes me think again that it's so important to come to keep coming back to the principles and the values that underpin these standards and systems, because it's so easy to get wrapped up in all the complexity and, and you know, because with a standard system, you do have to have clear sort of principles and rules, and you do have to have a certain amount of documentation. But at the same time, we have to leave enough flexibility in it and enough clarity around what are the things we're really trying to achieve that you can you can also have these trust based aspects to it as well and relationship based aspects. So thanks very much for that. And it'll be really interesting to look at some of these other sectors and what we can learn from them. And then also, I really um, appreciated what Christina was saying about indigenous communities and different values and how they they don't always feel that they can really participate in these global supply chains in, in a equitable way and that they may feel that standard systems are also not accessible or not not reflecting their value systems so I think that's a conversation that's really important to keep having and to see how how can we make global you know, markets and supply chains more accessible for everyone and how can fair world embed these values of reciprocity and and solidarity as well as you know maybe more western style thinking um yeah and then final thoughts um i noticed in the chat um sebastian was saying you know how can we really get more companies on board and take action on this so i guess it's a final thought just a a call to action so please do get in touch with us um, to see how you could become in fair, involved with fair wild and also involved in some of our consumer education and outreach work so we have a fair wild week coming up in june which would be fantastic to have more people involved with and there's also going to be this this webinar which i think is really more focused on the urgency of the issue and and how companies can take action on it so i think that's that's where i'll leave it but we have plenty of work ahead to work on new concepts around living income and and all of the new ways of the new methods that are being developed as well so plenty to do and we'll have to just keep going so thanks so much Anne for this opportunity for having this discussion thanks Brian and in the three minutes we have left I want to build on Marin's point that if people's hearts are activated, then the head will follow. And so Bryony, this challenge of how to get more people involved in what is a process, you know, it's not, you know, to stay in that middle ground, Elizabeth, that you outlined. Um, so Peter, starting with you, if, if you don't mind being put on the spot, why, what, why is this work important to you? What matters most? Well, you know, uh, I'm working mostly with the community, so to me, that's the part that matters most. It's one, 150 collectors, I think now, uh, which have uh, additional income, income because of it. Uh, so from my point of view, it all starts and it all ends there. Yeah. Marin. For me, this is going to be the principle of care, which is actually one of the principles for organic farming. And it's about <clears throat> what we do today uh, will have an impact on many, many generations to come. And we have to make sure the new generations are in a better place than what we are today, uh, because we know the challenges. So, so we have principle of care. Great, thank you. Christina? Oh, um, thank you. Um, I think what I've really learned today is um, sort of perspectives on the economic incentives versus cultural incentives for conservation and really interesting to hear from India. And I think we need to balance what I've learned is you need to balance both of those aspects going forward. So great to hear that Fair Wild, uh, including culture in their certification and want to broaden and include more indigenous peoples. <laughs> Thanks. Elizabeth, like the heart of this work for you, why it matters. Yeah, um, I think that everyone on the call is coming from the same place of wanting to make relationships right and just and equitable and fair. Um, and that's hard to do in just any one interpersonal relationship, much less a global supply chain. Um, so I think at the heart of this is the question of 
um, how do we show up um, with, with the intent to, to share responsibility and risk and reward, no matter um, what the context and what the pressures are? And how do we hold ourselves and others in the industry, um, especially those that we care about and respect and see as leaders in the industry, um, how do we hold them accountable to those same standards? What does that look like? Thank you. Dan? Uh, I think uh, I would like to say that uh, the bigger markets, uh, such as uh, other countries in Europe, like Germany and uh, probably U.S. I mean, they, people should uh, appreciate uh, the contribution of fair wildlife certification to health of the planet, and also communities. So, uh, there has to be, in my opinion, uh, if the if the demand for other products which are fair wildlife certified has to go up, so that uh, uh, whatever we are trying to do, we can also take it to scale. Uh, and there are more and more bigger companies also, also uh, part of the you know the game because you know there are many. Uh, interesting products. Uh, recently, we have realized uh, due to COVID pandemic, there are so much uh, demand for medicinal plants uh, that, uh, and these are going to be exploited unsustainably because uh, there is just requirement of that. And if there was, you know, if there were buyers for those plants, which are, you know, using fair wild certification, if that was also used in the, those, for those species, we will have definitely, we will definitely save those species if uh, because you know this is not the part. This is not the time to uh, make a killing. You know, it's it's it, people need it, but you have to also keep this for future generations. So fair wild uh, certification will stay, and it, it has it plays a very important role in sustaining communities and biodiversity. But I think uh, more and more companies and more and more markets need to uh, appreciate and start. You know, consumers need to be told about the importance of buying fair world certified products in much bigger manner. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Brian, do you want to add what's at stake, why this matters so much to you in 20 seconds? Oh, I think I think a lot has already been said, but yeah, I think the work just matters because even though there can be all these downward pressures, um, especially in difficult times, I mean, it's it's our world, isn't it? Our biodiversity and, and it's the rights of, of everyone to have a just and sustainable income. So that's, that's why it matters. Thanks, Anne. Thank you all so much for your participation and thanks everyone who has attended for this conversation. And we will draw, Bryony and I will draw the key concepts and we know this is a conversation that continues and the work then is on the ground which we will make sure doesn't get ignored. So thank you all again. Thank you for the invitation and uh, 